Welcome to the second. Which is mine? Everything. It's all for you. Okay, thank you. Welcome to the second of six lectures on the politics, economics, and philosophy of freedom. We call it Liberty Thon. It is followed at 3:30 by a discussion on the draft, and uh, that features Mark Chaffee, Alex Reyes, and Carol Moore. This is the second time in the course of the year in which I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker. He's been referred to, for better or for worse, as the guru of the libertarian movement. <laughs> but I like to think of him as an extraordinary scholar, economist, historian, political philosopher, professor of economics at Polytechnic Institute of New York, the author of scores of books, articles, publications. Uh, what else could I say? <laughs> he is talking today on the crisis of American foreign policy. Would you please welcome Dr. Murray Rothbard? Thank you. Thank you very much. The, uh, when you get into foreign policy, you get a, a peculiar area for libertarians because it's an area where many libertarians, if not most libertarians, feel uncomfortable. Feel that uh, they don't see where libertarian principles apply to uh, foreign policy. Now, if that's true, it would be kind of a peculiar hiatus because foreign policy is extremely important, uh, to say the least. Now, I think Personally, the foreign policy is the, the single most important area for, for libertarian application, consideration, agitation, whatever. Uh, what's the reason for this? Well, for one thing, I think it's fairly, fairly simple. Libertarian theory basically is, is opposed to any kind of aggression against personal property. Okay? Uh, we were against the theft, robbery, organized theft, robbery, whether it's one person doing it or half a dozen people or a group calling themselves the state. So we're opposed to this bitterly and, and, and heroically and whatever. But also we believe that murder is even more important than theft. It's even worse a crime, even worse an aggression than theft is. So that a mass murder is even more, even worse of a crime than, say, OSHA or price control. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, and yet, um, libertarians who are sound on the OSHA question and sound on price control and know the history of it and the philosophy of it and the economics of it and attack it, somehow when it comes to mass murder, there's blank out, as the <laughs> Randy used to say. <laughs> no, you know, nothing. No, nothing upstairs. And a mass murder question, which seems more important for myself and maybe many other people than these other more narrow economic questions. So we're opposed to murder of one person or another. We're opposed to murder of a group against an, uh, an individual, and we're opposed to mass murder. Okay. Okay. So this the and war is the organized expression in, in, in modern life of mass murder. It is mass murder, a giant scale. If we had a situation like in the good old days in the 15th century or something, where one king had his retinue, most you know, hired retinue, when they march out of the field, and the other king has his hired retinue, they march on the field on horses and everything, and they have this jousting contest, and whoever whoever's left on the field is declared the victor, and everybody else stands on the ramparts and cheers like a football match. It really was. Okay. something, and, and much of early warfare, not all of it, but in Renaissance Italy, for example, was essentially like a football, like a Super Bowl. Hey, they're out there. You know, <laughs> set your pants <laughs> and your buttons <laughs> to cheer for the king of Parma or whatever it is. And nobody really cares. <laughs> so... <laughs> Nobody's hurt either way. You know, whoever wins, so what? The Parma takes over instead of the, the, the Milan or whatever. Well, then days are unfortunately gone forever. So we're trying to restore it as much as possible with the Terrans, because nowadays the weapons of force wielded by the state apparatus, whether the various presidents, dictators, etc., kill innocent civilians along with everybody else, along with the retinue and the generals. They kill uh, millions of people. Innocent people trying to get out of the way can't do it. Now we have, by the way, a presidential order, what is it, 58 or something, I forget the name of it. And we're just very, we're all cheered and happy to know that even if the rest of the world, even if the entire American population gets wiped out in nuclear war, a goddamn government will continue eternally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sure it's a great, I'm sure it's a great consolation to all of us, you know, the president and the certain top people, call the, they're called the non-interruptibles. <laughs> So that the government cannot will not be interrupted. <laughs> <laughs> the non-interruptible will be whisked away, and by special, as soon as any as any Holocaust uh, coming up, they'll be whisked away to secret places all over the place, and they'll, they'll they will live eternally in bomb shelters or wherever, and while the rest of us die out. So that's not the and we're opposed to this. Okay, <laughs> opposed to mass warfare, and uh, then so how do we what, what do we do about so that? That in the sense that. 
we've been accused of being pacifists, not really pacifists. We don't, I mean, most of the, some libertarians are pacifists, but the mainstream of the movement is not pacifists. In other words, we believe if our sister is being raped, it's legitimate to, uh, you know, elim eliminate the rapist, okay? And uh, vice versa, it's self we're all in favor of, of using violence for self-defense, but this is not self-defense. This is something very different. This is mur the mass murder of innocent civilians, nuclearizing uh, you know, a huge part of the population. That's not self-defense. So, we're opposed to war, we're opposed to interstate warfare. Okay. Um, we're opposed then to the, the state A, or the rulers of state A, aggressing against citizens of some other state, or against their own state too, but that's not warfare, that's just irregular taxation and everything else we've been dealing with. Uh, so warfare can be defined as a situation where, they, where the rulers of state, of state A are killing and aggressing against the citizens of state B, uh, the unfortunate victims of state B. The fact they're also killing the rulers of state B doesn't really concern me at all. I mean, that's not, I mean, you know, it's sort of like goes, go husband, go bear, the old joke. I, mean, I don't really care if Khomeini and uh, Khomeini are out there slugging it out like the president of Iraq. I don't care who would win or who would lose. <laughs> it's like uh, W.C. Field, the magnificent, my, 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 my own special hero of the 20th century, was asked, uh, <laughs> W.C. Field was asked by the Saturday Evening Post during World War II. They had a, uh, a series of notables to answer the question, how would you end the war? What, what plan would you have to end the war? And Field sat down very seriously. It's not supposed to be a joke on his part, but he was really an anarchistic type. He sat down and he wrote out the, uh, his plan for ending the war, and they didn't publish it. <laughs> they felt it was subversive, I guess it was. <laughs> his plan was to take the leaders of both sides, or all sides, in the Hollywood Bowl, <laughs> you let them fight it out with sackfuls of dung. <laughs> <laughs> that was his plan. It was a magnificent plan. I was getting back to the old Renaissance joust thing. <laughs> anyway, so we don't have that. We have. We're trying to get libertarians are trying to get back to that sort of world. That if there is a state at all, a state should be confined to a minimal situation, at least. In a foreign affairs uh, situation, a state should not, at least, should not be aggressing against the citizens of the other country. I mean, bad enough, it's aggressing against the citizens of its own country. We can't eliminate that for a while yet, so we get to, so we eliminate the state altogether. But at least, as while the state is around, while individual states are around monopolizing the territories of the world, at least they shouldn't fight with each other. Because if they fight with each other, innocent civilians of all the states will be will get killed in the process. So this is the basic basis, the philosophic basis. A moral basis of a libertarian policy of isolationism, quote unquote, or non intervention. It stems from the idea of trying to minimize mass murder, trying to eliminate it or minimize it. So, so this means that no state should aggress against the people in another state. If somebody, if some state does, if Iraq, say the cur current Iraq Iranian situation, that every other state should stay the hell out. That's sort of a minimal situation. So, if you see two countries at war, you stay out so as to minimize the process of world murder. Uh, of course, the, uh, this is almost impossible I mean, for the United States these days to stay out of anything. But this, is the, this would be the, the, the injunction. Okay, these, these two countries are fighting it out. Stay out of it. Uh, this, of course, goes against the Wilsonian theories of uh, essentially operating our foreign policy since 1917. Namely, that if there's any war any place, the United States has got to get into it and decide, first of all, who the good guys are and who the bad guys are, and then leap in to defend the good guys. <laughs> right? This is what we've been doing, essentially, since 1914, since 1917. Uh, and uh, Charles Beer, the great historian, called this a policy of perpetual war for perpetual peace. And was waging perpetual war so as to achieve permanent peace. We've been waging a perpetual war, all right. That, 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 that part of it we've been doing, but perpetual peace has been more and more elusive and receding <laughs> beyond the horizon. For that reason, what we're doing in this policy is you're maximizing conflict, maximizing the area of conflict. If you stay out, countries stay out of conflict, then you're at least minimizing the scale of conflict. If you leap into it, then you're maximizing it. So and all, another point here is that the... The policy then of non-intervention abroad is the libertarian analog to non-intervention at home. Just as we try to keep the state intervening in the economy, intervening in religion, intervening in almost anything else, you're trying to cut state power in the domestic area. So you're trying to keep the state intervening in the foreign affairs area too. By doing that, you're cutting out, you're cutting down, or cutting out mass murder. You're also cutting down, cutting taxes, and the draft, and everything else. Because if we if we never went to war, or any threat of going to war, it's very difficult to impose a draft. Then the draft only has to be philosophic, you know, toughen up the moral fiber of America's youth, 
I'm not going to be able to get away with that much anymore. And moral fiber has gone to hell anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to be able to restore the moral fiber at this point. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and, and in addition to that, in addition to these basic philosophic reasons, there's a, there's a historical reason of great importance of libertarians, namely this. One of the things, when you get to be a libertarian, one of the first things you look at are forebears of the classical liberal movement of the 18th and 19th centuries. And there they were. They were very strong in many countries. They were strong in the United States. They were very strong in England. They were strong in Germany and Prussia for a while. They were strong in France. And something happened to them. What happened on the way to salvation? How do they decline? How do they disappear? How do they lose out? So when you first start in, in, interested in, in libertarianism, this is one of the first questions that meet you. Well, how come we you know, here we almost won and then we collapsed? And the answer stares everybody in the face, if you look at it historically. And the answer is always the war question. It's always patriotism. It's always the nation state at war. This is always the thing that happens. What happens is uh, libertarianism or classical liberalism is winning out. The state is diminishing in power and strength and everything else. And all of a sudden, bingo, there's the chance for aggrandizement of, of uh, the nation state. Go out and crush France or go out and crush so-and-so or whatever. Or watch out for the Belgian threat. Whatever it is, <laughs> whether it's the aggrandizement of the, your, your nation state abroad or the keeping, worrying about some mythical threats from, from over the hill, the, the, the people are mobilized, half the liberals, half the classical liberals sell out and say, well, it's more important, order is more important than liberty, security is more important. And they sell out the nation state of the militarism, and bingo, you've had it. And this is what happened in the 19th century, country after country. <clears throat> in, in Germany, it happened where in Prussia, they think now Germany is sort of a united country, which is always statist. It wasn't true. In, in Prussia, for example, the classical liberal movement was very strong. It was winning out. And a majority in Parliament. Um, and then Bismarck, or Bismarck's trying to, always trying to get money from Parliament, because that was the basic. He was running things without Parliament, except he had to get money from him, get taxes. And what he did was he sent, said, we will unify the German people by, by blood and iron. And he starts declaring war against Austria and then whatever, then more, et cetera, et cetera. And half the liberals split and say, yes, yes, we need a big, a big army and big navy uh, for the glorification of the nation state. And a, a, a liberal, a classical liberal I'm talking about, get split in half, and that's the end of it, the finish. And the same thing happens in Britain, where the, the liberals start selling out to the to, um, British Empire, the great cause of the British Empire, you know, you know spreading the message throughout the globe. Uh, the other thing there in Britain was the uh, crushing the Irish, which is always a uh, <laughs> it's always a policy which entranced the English people as how libertarian they were. And so the, the, the great Irish question would then rise up, and the, the liberals would split in half, and the state would take over again. At any rate, but in each case, you see patriotism, the war question, take over. In the United States was the same thing: the Spanish-American War, and then almost the and crushing the Philippines in order to liberate them. And, and on and on. And then, of course, that being the World War One, which kills the whole business and changes the whole course of foreign affairs. So, um, so in every situation, then you have, and also if you look at American history, okay, American history, if you look at a, it's, it's a zigzag. If you, if you, if you, you can't measure this, of course. We can have a, some sort of a, you know rough degree of measurement, of degree of liberty, how liberty is going in the world, or degree of the state versus liberty. Okay. You start off. The state being very minimal. Then in the War of 1812, there's a big increase in federal government, state of state as power, like that. Then it takes about 30 years to wash out the effects of the War of 1812. They get back because of a dedicated Jacksonian movement. And we're back then, in 1840, we're back to the pre-1812 degree of statism. This is, this is the degree of statism on the y-axis. <laughs> <laughs> then bingo comes the Civil War. And that sort of does it. Then we're way up here. We never really washed that out at all. Maybe a little bit. And then World War One, and then, then we're off. And in other words, we have a ratchet effect where every war has a huge increase in statism. And that's that's it. That's the occasion of statism is increasing the war. As, as Randolph Bourne, the great libertarian, said in World War One, war is the health of the state. As soon as you have war, everybody said, well, we can't have liberty during wartime, and bingo, you know, great increase in great government control and taxes. And planning and everything else, and the draft, you know, the whole business, and very little of it washes out afterward. In other words, as Madison says, and as Cato's letters say, if you start with an emergency situation with the state supposed to increase its power, just an emergency, emergency lasts forever, becomes part of the American heritage. <laughs> That's it. For example, the goddamn withholding tax, which is the key to the federal income, federal power now, right? Without the withholding tax, you imagine how the average person would kick in, you know, five thousand dollars in one check. 
The whole income tax system the collapse. The withholding tax only came in during World War II. It only came in as a so-called wartime emergency measure right, for the war effort. It was supposed to disappear after the 1945. Of course, here we are. It's part of the American heritage now, right? I mean, even, even our beloved presidential candidate, the Libertarian Party, doesn't advocate repeal of the withholding tax. So, uh, we have a little dig there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well so, learned. Well learned. So, <laughs> so, we have a situation where, okay, so we have a situation where war is the health of the state, where where we have to uh, avoid war and mass murder, et cetera, et cetera. This is the key question, a primary question for me. Uh, so when, when, when we estimate who's the more dangerous presidential candidate, for example, <coughs> it is a fiction. A libertarian presidential candidate deserves tries to maintain the fiction, which I suppose, I suppose is maybe necessary, maybe not. But all other candidates are equally bad. The libertarian candidate... And there's half a dozen status, actually about 13 status candidates. <laughs> okay? But you can't really maintain that fiction. Some people are worse than others. I mean, some people, status might be equally bad, but some status are worse than, more equal than others. <laughs> okay? For, and so the Ronald Reagan, even though he, he um, and many people think it's very close to a libertarian position because he claims, claims to be in favor of tax cuts, and although well, he really isn't, claims to be in favor of free market, although well, he really isn't. Uh, he also was in favor of nuclear war, I mean, direct nuclear <laughs> confrontation. To me, therefore, becoming the most dangerous candidate because all the other, if we all go up in nuclear incineration, all the rest of the more academic and maybe more interesting questions like price control or free will and determinism, all these things become pointless <laughs> if we're all washed away. So, um, so the, the war and peace question becomes the premier question to worry about. Okay, so. Um, the, um, that's part of the crisis, so far, 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 far. so far we haven't been empirical. So far we've been more or less, well, sort of empirical, more or less the, the historical and, and talking about philosophically. Now we talk, now we come to individual states, individual governments. Now most people are caught up in the Wilsonian myth. Woodrow Wilson, in order to sell his war policy, policy of global war and global crusading, uh, which has been adopted by every, really every president since then. In order to sell this, propound of the myth which most people, Americans, still believe, most libertarians believe in a different form, namely, in any conflict between governments, in any foreign policy crisis, the more, the more dictatorial one is, must, must be at fault. In other words, if you have country A and country B, okay, country A is uh, more democratic, you have people voting, and more free speech, let's say freer internally, okay, uh, and country B is dic dictatorship, okay, and, and very little internal freedom. People are sort of slaves of the state. The country, if there's a conflict between them, a foreign policy conflict and a war between them, country A must be, country B must be to blame. The dictatorship must be more aggressive in foreign affairs. Now this, I say, is held by most libertarians. It's also an easy way of avoiding empirical analysis of what's going on in the world. You've got, you got two countries, Ruritania and Waldavia, two hypothetical countries. Ruritania is freer Domestically, and Waldavia is more tyrannical. Therefore, if there's a fight between them, Waldavia well, well, must be at fault, right? Wrong. Just so happens it ain't true. Be nice and cozy if it were true. Then we wouldn't have to read about foreign affairs. We just figure out which is more domestically tyrannical, and that's, uh, that's it. They're at fault. Unfortunately, or fortunately, it doesn't work that way. There are many countries which have been despotic and tyrannical internally, which have not been aggressive externally at all. Other countries which have been free or internally, which have been very aggressive, and vice versa. There's all this historical example of all four permutations. But for example, the Cambodia-Vietnam fight a year or two ago, whenever that occurred, there's no question about the fact Cambodia is more dictatorial internally. We had to, we had to choose, the gun were pressed to our head, and we had to choose between living in Cambodia and Vietnam. I think all of us would have chosen Vietnam. Vietnam was at least slightly freer. I mean, Cambodia was an absolute monstrosity, an absolute hell on earth. Okay? Uh, people, you know, being dragged out of hospitals in order to get them get to the land and things like that. Okay, if you, if you say one whisper of criticism or anything, you're shot. Yeah, things like that. Okay, so this is uh, so Cambodia is probably the worst internally, the worst country in, the, in history, maybe in history, or at least in modern history. And yet, Cambodia was definitely not a Vietnam was definitely the aggressor in this fight. Right? Vietnam launched the attack, conquered Cambodia, and so forth and so on. So here, so that's just one example. Albania, which is only slightly less tyrannical than Cambodia, right, hasn't been aggressive at all in foreign affairs. They've been very quiet externally. Of course, they haven't been very strong, but other states aren't strong either. So, 
so the, we have a situation where the degree of, of internal tyranny really has nothing to do with, the, with, the, with the, whether or not a country is a foreign policy. Uh, so once we look at that that situation, we have, have a completely. Then, that means we have to then learn something about foreign affairs before we shoot our mouths off about who's at fault. Okay, in any given situation. <clears throat> okay, so empirically and historically, if we look at the situation since World War One, and before it, we find out that the, the freer countries, quote unquote, are the, are the ones mostly at fault in, in various conflicts, <clears throat> and. And in order to do that, of course, you have to sell, if you're more democratic, you have to sell the country the republic with more lying propaganda. In the sense, I mean, but all, all governments have propaganda. Uh, but the, the, democrat, the more democratic country has to be more, have to, has to be more propagandistic, has to be more hypocritical, and they have more to overcome uh, in selling the, their, their situation. But they've been able to do it. And the amount of lies the United States American public has, has imbibed through the media is enormous. Not just about Vietnam and so forth, but uh, all previous wars that we've been engaged, engaged in. <clears throat> Vietnam, in fact, Vietnam, the lies were exposed. It was the one situation where we had a, a real opposition to the war in this country. So all of a sudden, the press and the media, which had been spent the last 40 years living on government handouts uh, and just repeating them, all of a sudden became fierce, fearless, independent, muckraking observers and analysts. Uh, something became honest. So for a couple of years, they had honesty in the media. They were able to expose the situation. But it hasn't happened very often, either, either before or since. So uh, it's a problem of uh, finding out exactly what's going on. Another thing is, among libertarians, we have a situation, many libertarians, we have this situation. Any government official says anything, immediately dis disbelieve, right? I mean, the, he the head of HEW says something, yeah, liar. <laughs> the head of OSHA says something, yeah, liar. If a Pentagon says something, it's believed implicitly, it's like that. Ah, Pentagon, right? So we have a, a Pentagon says it must be true. So we have, we have a double standard of operation among libertarians on uh, uh, the federal government. If anybody except the military says something, it's, it's a pack of lies, it's statism, it's tyrannical, etc., etc. The military says it must be correct. So we have a very peculiar double standard, which, of course, which is very similar to the Bismarck thing. It says it's part of the same syndrome, We're ready to sell out on, far, on the so-called foreign far policy, a so-called uh, threat to the nation. At any rate, empirically, which I honestly can't prove here, I'm not the time, but currently the, the, the problem has been that the first, the major war center, center for war before World War One was Britain and France and, and, and Tsarist Russia. Oh, Jesus. Ah. I'm going to uh -uh. It's okay. Hold on. Just don't and secondly, or the major war center after that uh, has been the United States, especially after World War II, where we dispossess the British Empire and take over. The role of the old British Empire, British Britain having been economically bankrupt because of, because essentially because of their imperial, uh, they couldn't they couldn't maintain an imperial venture anymore. So we have a situation where an, an empire is very costly, especially to the taxpayer and, and kind of form of inflation, etc. And so uh, the United States was strong enough to pick up the tab. I don't know whether it's still strong enough to pick up the tab. It's getting a little weaker. And the dollar is getting weaker, etc. But since from from 1945 to about 1970. The United States was lord, rule, of, rule, rule of the roost, lording over the whole world, and had enough money to carry us off, or enough, enough taxpayer money for us to carry it off. Uh, it's now getting to the point where we have to sort of reconsider a little bit, and have this, uh, which is a part of the process of reconsidering whether the government's effective at all, whether the government can do anything, whether the government's act, actions are really productive, or whether they're counterproductive, or whatever. So uh, we have a situation where since World War II, the United States is actually running the world, except for the communist bloc and other, other countries which break loose. They're trying to run the world. If anything happens anywhere in the world, right? Anywhere. It doesn't matter. Ruritania, which is the, my mentor, Lily von Mises, is named for an abstract country. If something happens in Ruritania, my God, the American defense perimeter is a state. Right? <laughs> King so-and-so is top we got to save it. <laughs> Why? Who knows? Because it's destabilizing. The United States position almost is any change whatsoever is bad. Right? Any change, these days, well, even the Polish, even the Polish workers' strike, which is a, a certainly heroic and, 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 and inspiring action, even there, the United States was really against it because it might rock the boat. We don't want the boat rock. They're running most of the world. We don't want the boat rocked. <laughs> That's essentially American foreign policy. And uh, if we take, if most of the people of the world don't like their present regime, which is 
true and justifiable. It means that American foreign policy is putting itself flatly against the wishes of most of the population. And the, the, we wonder why we keep losing. Basically, why we keep losing because we, we wind up propping up every crummy government in the world, every dictator, every unpopular government, because there's anything else would be destabilized, be rock, rocking the boat, which is, of course, the, right, the army position in England. Never rock the boat, any bureaucracy. Don't make waves. Don't make waves for the people in power. And so we find ourselves the ally of every, every tin pot dictator in power, and we have to prop them up. And any the tin pot dictator loses somehow a loss of faith in the United States, <coughs> the loss of American foreign policy, the loss of jazz. So uh, that, uh, that's part of the crisis, American foreign policy. The, the libertarians aren't trying to do what should be trying to do, is to get the United States not to intervene in countries abroad, and also to try to get a, disarm, a nuclear disarmament agreement, because uh, we're getting nuclear arms are proliferating. Pretty soon, you know, 10, 15 years, every, every country is going to have a nuclear weapon of some sort. And, and, and nuclear weapons hang over the population of the Earth like sort of Damocles. We always get started. We just lost a damn missile somewhere. Where was it? In Nebraska? <laughs> lost it. Well, it's somewhere out there. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so, so uh, and, 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 and mutual disarmament, a nuclear disarmament agreement, and disarmament agreement of all weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and armament, this armament terminology is called this armament down to police level, in other words, down to machine gun. Right? Uh, it's now much easier than ever was because of the satellites and everything. It's very easy to inspect. The inspection problem is virtually eliminated because it's, it's very much easier now for satellites to inspect to find out what's going on and whether there are any weapons, etc., out there. So, this, the United States has been the main obstruction of any kind of disarmament agreement, it has been since 1955. In 1955, we kept pressing Russia to agree in a nuclear disarmament agreement. They said, well, we don't know about it, so on so on. Finally, on May 10th, 1955, the day which would go down, the day of infamy, uh, historic day in American history, on May 10th, 1955, Khrushchev, at the, at the disarmament talks, says to the United States representative, okay, we agree. We agree on general complete disarmament. Let's go get it. Let's go do it. You know, with unlimited inspection and all the rest of it. The American reaction was, my oh, God, things have changed. Uh, we we got to suspend the talks for a few months. I got to accept our our our, our, our accepted our our, our, our our proposal. That's not part of the that's not part of the card. I wasn't considered that the computers there weren't computers back then. Didn't program that one. So we suspended the talks. We said nope, sorry, the conditions have changed. Then we can, then Eisenhower comes out with his meretricious, hypocritical, and evil open skies proposal. Uh, in other words, we dropped the idea of disarmament along with inspection. And we came up with the idea of open sky, which sounds great for the, for the average person. Open sky, why not? You want open skies. <laughs> <laughs> but what it really meant is that it should be unlimited inspection and no disarmament, <laughs> which has virtually been the American position ever since. So, at any rate, this, um, I'll, I'll turn this over to questions now. But the thing is, that, that's the, 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 basic, the basic thing is we need a complete uh, change in American foreign policy back essentially to the position. The 19th century before 1890s. Not that it was perfect then, but it was more or less on the right track, uh, certainly rhetorically and uh, in practice, uh, even you know, less so, but still more or less going along that line. And so, uh, okay, I'll turn it over to uh, comment, question, whatever. Questions? Yeah. Uh, Uh, so I, I, I don't, uh, 
I don't, I'm not willing to turn the, the body, our bodies over to the state anyway. I don't see why they own our bodies and uh, leaving us with, with pure spirit. <laughs> so I, I, I don't I don't see the relationship there. Like, as far as historically, uh, it's a mixed bag. I mean, the 17th century libertarians were were mostly Christian. Uh, on the other hand, everybody was Christian in that. So uh, by the 18th and 19th century, Christianity almost died out in the United States. So, I mean, mostly. There's a, ser- there's a series of... Um, the founding fathers, for example, the, the right-wingers now say, the moral majority people say the founding fathers were Christian. Well, baloney, almost none of them were Christian. Only Patrick Henry and Sam Adams. They were older, even the younger generation. Even George Washington wasn't Christian. What they were were deists. And so they would talk about God all the time. What they meant by God was essentially the, the clock wonder. You know, this, the eight creator who wound the clock up and wound the universe up and then left everybody alone. And that's essentially deism. And so most of the founding fathers were deists. And so... Uh, Christianity only gets really revived by the 1820s and 30s of the, of the, of the hopped up uh, revival movement, which then brings it back in a big way. But at any rate, um, so I don't, I don't uh, the, uh, as far as, again, historically, 19th century, the 19th century, the, 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 there were two kinds of, from 1820 on, from, say, 1900, uh, even later, there were two kinds of Christianity in the United States. There were the, the pietists, the evangelical pietists, who were hopped up Born again types, which are now quite familiar with, <laughs> which I wasn't very familiar when I was growing up. And uh, at any rate, um, the born again types were status in every area. They wanted, uh, in the personal uh, libertarian area, they wanted, they wanted to crush, stamp out sin by the use uh, of the secular arm, because uh, they felt that every individual was responsible for not only their own salvation but everybody else's salvation. Because if you don't work. And your maximum strength to save everybody else, and you yourself will not be saved, which is a tremendous incentive to meddling in everybody's life. <laughs> so, so their view was, they've got to go out and try to save everybody else. Because salvation meant removing the opportunities for temptation into sin. And they saw sin everywhere. Sin was maximal. <laughs> Almost anything anybody does was considered sin. So, they, so the, the function of government was to stamp out sin, stamp out liquor in particular, and dancing, and God knows what else. So then the, the pietists then transpose that from the federal to more economic policy, national economic policy, so in the same way we have that big government in Washington to keep out cheap foreign labor, and, you know, all that sort of thing, and increase purchasing power through inflation, judicious inflation, and the rest of it. In the meantime, the, the, that was the Whig and Republican Party. In the meantime, the Democratic Party was essentially the party of the, of the liturgical religious groups, Catholics and High Lutherans. And, uh, and, uh, and their idea was that uh, essentially the you don't get saved with this process of born again. You get saved with joining the church and obeying the sacraments and so forth. And so they didn't consider the state had any real role in salvation. And uh, what they want is to keep these jerks off our backs. You know, to keep, these, to keep our liquor and keep our parochial schools, keep Sunday uh, uh, beer gardens and all that. And so you have, all through the 19th century, there's a constant struggle, political struggle on local and state level between the pietists who want to enforce uh, Christian morality through the state and the Catholics and Lutherans want to keep them off their backs, and the and then again the Democratic Party extending that to national affairs, saying, look, the same it's the same SOBs are trying to take away your liquor and parochial school laws, are trying to take away cheap foreign products and uh, rob your savings through inflation, etc., etc. Et so what you had, so I know this it's not it's not, a, it's not clear cut on the religious question, and certainly spirituality is not seen that has not been on the net as an anti-statist uh, thing. Is if there's any, if there's a government, the argument for it, see, interesting enough, the minimal status libertarians, the ones that want to keep, keep government, keep it confined to, the, to, to police and, ju- and judges and all that, their argument is if you have, if you allow differing uh, defense agencies within one, uh, one territory, you have conflicts. You have to have one monopoly uh, state agency to defend people. Now, these same, but of course we don't have it, we have one monopoly state agency within each, each country. But we don't have it over the world. So um, these same minimal state level patches then say, well, okay, you've got to confine your monopoly of coercion, at least to your own area, because if you get beyond that, 
it's not meddling in Belgium or something, then you've got, then you have eternal conflict, because it means that other states coming in will also then interfere, and you have a constant inter jurisdictional disputes between governments. So just on that basis alone, I'm, I'm in favor of confining, if we have a state at all, which I'm opposed to, since we have it, uh, we should at least be, its activity should at least be confined to its own territorial area, where you know, it can only oppress its own citizens and not, and not oppress other citizens. Otherwise, I say you have eternal conflict, or constant temptation of constant conflict. On, on that same yeah. line of thought, if, if it were the case that uh, President Carter decided uh, to really minimal say that that's wrong, not to minimize uh, that yeah. order, yeah. Um, but uh, he knows that if you brought the Russian order, he would have denied the attack. Yeah, the Minimize what? I'm pretending, I'm pretending yeah. that, that somehow it was known and true that American. Well, see, misunderstand. I, I should make my position clear. The goal of each state should not be to minimize mass murder throughout the world. The goal of each state should be to confine its own murder activities. Because <laughs> I don't think the American states possibly eliminate murder by the world. It's just stop murdering itself, right? I mean, that's the, that's the difference. In other words, I don't consider that that the, the Amer American government or any other government should be the, the, the carrier of, of, of moral principles. It should confine its activities to minimize its own murder. Otherwise, you have perpetual war, perpetual peace. Uh, and if if, uh, if we take the big Russian threat, and all these jerks out here in the United States who claim as a Russian threat, go out there and fight themselves, kind of get, a, get, a, get an international legion together and go into Europe. Right? Fly in there. Like, you know, like, uh, get a sort of a voluntary Antebi sort of thing. All right, let's go out there with the brigade. And as you say, I don't think there's a Russian threat to Western Europe. But that's, again, a empirical question which we can get into if you want. But it's another one. Um, I was in, in response to that, I was thinking of um, he would raise the case of the Polish strikes and how yeah. heroic that is. It seems like the American, the best American foreign policy to, to alleviate that situation would be to pull back from NATO because the main thing that the Soviets are concerned about, the Soviets do have a concern about keeping Poland on their side and keeping a buffer between uh, their own borders but if they have less fear of American invasion then they have less excuse to withdraw troops from Afghanistan and so on to invade Poland. So it seems like the best thing we could do for the heroic strikers in, in Poland would be to reduce the American government's threat to the Polish people, which is what justifies the Poland yeah. government's oppression over the Polish people and the Soviet yeah. oppression over there. Absolutely, no question about that, that, that. Russia has been invaded through Poland at least three times in the 20th century, a, a, a long history and a long and sharp history of invasion. They're, and they're therefore concerned about another invasion. As you say, if you eliminate the, the American NATO threat, that would, that would, then the whole thing. I mean, the Russian Imperium is falling apart anyway, even with this cohesion posed by the American threat. If the American threat were eliminated, the whole thing would fall apart much faster. And it's pretty clear. I mean, the, the, the war market in the United States keep talking about the Russia's uh, uh, you know, spreading throughout the world constantly. Russia's full, I mean, the whole, the whole communist imperialism is falling apart. China, of course, we know about. Although the right wingers, the Reaganites, it took them 15 years to claim that China, to admit that China was not, not, no longer pro-Russian. You know, first they, for 10 years they said it's all, it's all a hoax. <laughs> they it. They're practically killing each at each other's throats all the time, the Chinese-Russian border. <laughs> it took 10 years before the well, it's, it's, it's a Kremlin plot. So Yugoslavia, I mean, hope you know, Western Europe, communists are falling apart. Only the Communist Party of the United States is still really devoted to Russia, and Air Force they might have nothing. You know, <laughs> and, uh, half a dozen elderly folk over seventy. So it's it's so they and if and, and, and this cohesion which imposed from the external threat, which is fairly I mean, see one of the problems about this whole this whole uh, uh, nuclear weapons and missile system is one of the things that scares the Russian step and it scares me also. Like I uh, I sympathize with the position here. Is that the Russians have been concentrating on so called dirty weapons, dirty missiles. In other words, if you're, if you have your second strike thing, which is monstrous to begin with, but at least it's a second strike. In other words, if you have, if, if, if the idea is to deter the other guy by, by having a second strike capability, which will then wipe out the other guy's cities, then you have your missiles trained on the other guy's city, right? Okay, which, which is what the Russians have been doing. So, uh, so that we, 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 
if we um, start, you know, drop nuclear bombs on them, they'll go wipe out in New York, Washington, etc. Now, what the, the so they have to do that, if you have to, if you want to wipe out somebody else's cities, the missiles can be dirty, they can be imprecise, you don't need precision, it doesn't matter whether they drop a bomb on Greenwich Village or 42nd Street, we'll wipe out anyway. Okay? <laughs> However, if you're interested in the first strike, if you're interested in those knocking out, then you're interested in knocking the other guy's missile side on that, then you have to be very precise, you have to have a, have a, have a targeted thing with very precision, so you hit the thing right directly. And the thing that scares, the Russians that scares me, Steph, is in the last few years, we have been concentrating on very precise nuclear weapons, precise missiles, spending, spending a lot of money on precision. So what's the point of precision if we, if we don't want a first strike? We want a first strike capability. The Russians have been desperately saying, asking for an agreement of no, no first nuclear strike. Neither side will have a strike. We, refuse to, we constantly refuse to agree to this in the United States. This is our main card in the world. If we want to exercise our... A big stick across the world. The only thing we've got is a nuclear weapon. We haven't got a big army. We're not going to march into Russia in the, in the infantry. <laughs> so all we've got is a goddamn nuclear weapon. That's why we'll never give them up. That's why America is a major threat to world peace and not Russia. It's just one basic reason. One, you mentioned the uh, confusion libertarians tend to have on foreign policy, <laughs> uh, confusing domestic policy with uh -huh. foreign policy. Uh, one point adding to this confusion is that, un unfortunately, in the United States and England, and perhaps in Germany too, but I'll talk about America and Great Britain, the, the most militaristic, the most dictatorial, the most uh, progressive statists in regard to militarism were unfortunately, whatever, the most, the most socialistic mm -hmm. in domestic policy. Teddy Roosevelt with his antitrust laws, Wilson with his reg regulatory commission, Roosevelt with his New Deal, uh, Kennedy with the Great Society, Carter with his stagflation and the Department of Education. The most interventionist and militaristic uh, regimes, the most uh, fascistic regimes in, in a foreign policy sense, has to an American or a, or a British uh, experience, personal experience, lifetime experience, has also been linked to greatly increased state power uh, in the socialistic or communistic sense at home. And consequently, it's very, very easy for Americans to believe when they're talking about Russia, Iraq, Belgium, Germany, that, needless to say, if they're aggressive outside, uh, they must be dictatorial at home, because this, yeah, this is their own personal yeah. experience. Yeah, but the personal experience has been filtered through their eyes on the media. Sure. I mean, they, they, yeah. I mean, with Russia, for example, Russia's foreign policy since London has been pretty pacific. I mean, we have, would that we had adopted that kind of foreign policy. It's been very, it's been very cautious. The basis of it has been the, the guard, the humble, the socialist motherland, always guard their own, their own, uh, their own hides, uh, to the maximum extent, how will the world revolution, but basically the Soviet position to run it. Uh, and so the, the, the principal thing is to safeguard the socialist motherland, these Rus the Russian state apparatus, and, and, you know, let the other Regardless communist, of yeah, brutal and let the other communist party go to make up a yeah. uh, virtual death camp yeah. in the Soviet Union. Right, so well, no, it's not even, I mean, it's, it's very rational position from their point of view. They, they, they felt that they were surrounded by capital, so-called capitalist states, mm -hmm. and, uh, what they've got to do is to safeguard that situation, hope for the world revolution, and that's it. And not, not really commit their resources to it. For example, Stalin, uh, after World War II, um, Really scuffled with communists. He really gave it the death blow to the world communist movement. Uh, and Hitler conquered, uh, conquered most of Europe. Okay, so as Hitler was retreating, as Hitler's regime was falling apart, the uh, power vacuum developed, which was filled by the guerrilla movements in these countries: France, Italy, Greece, which were uh, guerrilla movements mostly communists. So we could have e easily had communist governments in France and Italy uh, after the war, which would have killed NATO and everything else. Stalin told them to shut up. Stalin ordered the French and the Chinese Communist Party not to take over and, and submit themselves to a coalition headed by the Gaulle and whoever was in Italy. And a couple of years later, the Gaulle knifed them, the Italian guys knifed them in Iraq. And they did this because they took orders because, because Russia subordinated the interests of the world communist movement to the interests of the foreign policy of the Russian nation state, which said they wanted peace with the West, didn't want any trouble. 
so, he, so he struggled, and at least the same similar thing happened. It took a little bit longer because uh, Greek, the Greek, Greek communists got some aid from Tito, who at that time was broken. So Stalin, if he wanted to, could have conquered Western Europe. Yeah, well, yeah. Stalin could have taken over France and Italy very easily. And he, he didn't do it because he wanted peace with the, with the United States almost at any price. And this, and this, and what he got for his pain is the Cold War put it on. So, um, uh, and this is what this is. This is part of the. Don't forget, Lenin's Lenin's first foreign policy action was a magnificent appeasement treaty of Brussels, possibly so loud by all of Western Russia, all of Western Russia's parents. Ukraine, White Russia, all surrendered to the German army, and he, he put it over the not only every other party in, in Russia, but also the Bolshevik party, who mostly against it, hated it. The Bolshevik Central Committee voted like ten to one against him, by sheer force of will and argument. It was, this argument of the guys now finally got the piece of the treaty of Cups through. But that's typical of what the, what they were willing to do in order to get peace, you know, peace with Poland. So, um, and of course, Russia's expansion after World War II was solely and purely a function of the fact that uh, Hitler would attack them in July 22nd, 1941. It was the key. There's no revisionism that occurred on that. Hitler attacked Russia in July 22nd, 1941. Yeah, but everything yeah, along with know this, how unprovoked and dastardly the crime was. No, it wasn't provoked at all. No, no, Russia. No, no, it wasn't question. I mean, it, was, it wasn't just so unprovoked that he said that the Russian army was almost defenseless. Stalin had such great trust in Hitler was keeping the, the pact, but he, he, the army was practically, well, practically reduced to nothing. They were, Hitler almost won, which they wouldn't have done if the Russian army had been beefed up any, any, you know, any feasible extent. So, as a result, and that's you know, common knowledge that, that Stalin was just totally... So he wasn't trying to provoke a war at all. Quite the contrary, he had deep trust in his friend Hitler's specific intention. Hitler, unfortunately, or... Yeah, well, sure. And plus, uh, attacking, coming to the aid of Japan, which didn't happen. But anyway, that's yeah. But that the <laughs> uh, yeah. Because yeah. um, uh, yeah. your uh, expertise, I know happens in this discipline area. Uh, I'd like to ask a question from the economic sure. point. Uh, even uh, a large number of liberals today uh, more or less admit that uh, the New Deal didn't actually uh, pull the United States out of the depression or the world out of the right. worldwide depression, but in fact, World War II did. Hmm. And uh, since, in fact, uh, there seems to be a lot of evidence that you know it was irresponsible monetary policy had a major uh, <coughs> part in, cause, in causing the depression, and it's never really been uh, adjusted. We've gone from war to war. Now they're getting farther and farther apart, but there's still there's still this this thing you know that when things start to get bad, uh, the economy can get a shot through a war. Now. Uh, that's nothing re revelationary, but what I'm wondering about is whether you feel that the, the real price for uh, physical irresponsibility in, in uh, pre-World War II uh, area, if the real price has ever actually been paid, or in other words, are these, uh, these wars actually have kept us from, from uh, economic mm. collapse? And if that is to any extent true, how much uh, do you think will be? The uh, motivation of the wars was part of this. Well, I think World War II is definitely a motivation. Thing. I mean, to get us out of the Prussian line. I mean, for example, you got we had 10 million unemployed in 1941. You draft 10, 10 million people in the army, that cures the unemployment problem right there. Right. <laughs> so I think no, I think that's definitely true. There has been some liquidation of the investment since then. Each recession has done some some good work in limiting the investment. Like the 73, 75 recession was pretty good in that sector, so, you know, eliminating a lot of the bad investments. Uh, there's still obviously a lot of unliquidated investments. Right, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, obvious. Uh, so there's still a lot has to be done. I mean, that's, whether or not the, the motivations for the other wars, I don't, I don't think so. Well, who knows? I'm not I'm prepared to prepare on the hypothesis. They get an arm or something. Certainly it is true that the more socialist what? residents uh, are also the mo most... Well, one thing, uh, one thing is that the... Uh, Any time... Any, let's put it this way. Look at it in reverse. Any time... About 10, 15 years ago, they wanted to elim eliminate the Brooklyn Navy Yard, remember? Mm -hmm. And they said, all the, all, even the Pentagon types, the Brooklyn Navy Yard is obsolete, has no military function whatsoever. They couldn't eliminate it. Immediately, the howl from every goddamn politician in the state. You can't do that. You eliminate 25,000 jobs and all that. And so they kept it. So I mean, if, if, if every time you create a military situation, you create a, a permanent uh, parasite in your back, that's already an obvious situation. You can't, at least, you can't demilitarize. Then you have, what are you going to do with these, with these people? So obviously, actually, what you do do if you have a free market, such as when the uh, 
World War II demobilization, after World War II, the, the 10 million people were absorbed very quickly. And all economists predicted a big depression. It wasn't because the, the uh, economy was flexible enough. We, we reduced taxes and all stuff. The economy was flexible enough to, to take on these people and a good job and all the rest of it. So the actual adjustment would take a very, very short period of time. The market adjusts very quickly to the legal loan. Remarkably quickly. Peter. Do you have any comments about the and the policy Yeah, it's one of my favorite topics. I, I, <laughs> I've been abjured by my uh, my colleagues in the Libertarian Party that I should never I never criticize the party outside party <laughs> outside strict party channels. I think it's all baloney. So, uh, <laughs> the uh, the foreign policy actually the the, the actual the structure of the car campaign is such that the, the foreign policy has not been as bad as the other areas because the structure of the, of the <laughs> car campaign is to pitch, to, to tailor the image, it's all image anyway, to tailor the image of a campaign to what's, what, uh, what the car people himself, themselves call low-tax liberalism. In other words, to, to, make, to make Tom Wicker like us. Okay. And, and to the extent this has succeeded, in other words, uh, Tom Wicker likes this, and so does uh, Anthony Lewis and the New York Times and Washington Post and all that. So if, you're, if your aim in life is to have these people like us, then I guess the aim has succeeded. That's not my aim in life. <laughs> now, so the idea is to make, to, to so how do, how do you get liberals to like us? All right? The sort of liberal image they have is young middle class liberals, sort of people who read the New York Times and write the New York Times, right? Okay. How do you get, well, what are they like? What are they for and what are they against? If you, if you look down the checklist of deviations, the clock deviations from the true correct position, every deviation conforms to this image. In other words, not to what the hawker and these people are playing, like hawker's national campaign, right? Well, it's all bumbling. You know, it's all, uh, uh, it's just, you know, the heat of the campaign, Clark is speaking in St. Louis or something, and it says something. It's all accident. But all the accidents fit into one pattern. The accidents are never in the other direction. The accidents are all... I remember when I'm in my days in the, in the ultra right wing in the 40s, uh, they used to say Eisenhower, the defensive Eisenhower, was he was a bumbler. And the right wingers used to say, aha, but if he, if he was a, only a bumbler, then he bumbled once in a while in a pro American direction, not, not a pro communist direction. <laughs> okay, so this, so the bumbling is always in this direction. In other words, the bumbling is the direction of, of the New York Times liberal. And what's the New York Times liberal position? Well, New York Times liberal is against nuclear energy, in favor of the ERA, is in favor of. Uh, the welfare state was slightly more efficient, you know, like a slightly lower tax welfare state. The Clark people said they will not cut welfare payments at all until we achieve full employment. And what the hell does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> anything, any, anybody knows anything about economics knows a lot of nonsense. So we'll never, achieve, never achieve full employment. So, uh, um, and, they, and of course, the same as immigration thing. Now, we've been pounding, myself and other people have been pounding away almost hysterically at the car campaign for a long time. We have certain marginal improvements, like we got them to not to come out against Mexican immigration. In other words, the uh, the original Clark campaign position was that they uh, they're in favor as libertarians. This is something like this. this is a typical pattern of a sellout. As libertarians, of course, if this were a libertarian society, we'd be in favor of open immigration, naturally. However, <laughs> since we don't live in an open and free society, we have to have, we have to be realistic. So we can't have more too many Mexican immigrants because they'll, they'll get on the welfare rolls. So as long as we have welfare, we can't have too many immigra too many immigrants. They did come out with the abolition of the INS. Yeah, well, uh, finally, after his first, <laughs> Clark's first position was that they shouldn't shoot the kill, the border patrol. <laughs> I swear, that was his position, we shouldn't shoot the kill. I don't know what we're supposed to do, maybe only... You know, tranquilizer weapons. <laughs> it's only after fanatical attack that they finally said, yeah, okay, well, you know, you know, the point is, the middle New York Times liberals only like Mexicans in Mexico. They, they don't, they're not so keen on Mexicans here. So, so this is the sort, as I said, the whole thing is tailored in this kind of, this kind of position. Okay, when you get to, um, uh, when you get to uh, the foreign policy, then most New York Times liberals are pretty dovish. So the sellout hasn't been too great in this area. However, um, they, the, 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 the New York, the Clark White Paper on Foreign, foreign Affairs says uh, it's all it's all Ravenel stuff, and it's all cost-benefit analysis. The, the the emphasis is like this: Well, West Germany and Japan are now uh, rich rich enough to pay for their own weapons, pay for their own defense. Therefore, why should we pay for it? Well, I mean, it's a, I mean, it's a, I suppose it's a pretty good position. On the other hand, that's not what we've been fighting for for 30 years or whatever. 
You know, in other words, the implication is that it's a little technical. And the implication, matter of fact, they exp explicitly, Clark said that in the 1940s and 50s, it was okay to pay for West German Japanese defense, because then they weren't strong enough. It's only now that they're strong enough that we should get them off their ba our back. So it's purely a taxpayer thing, you know, cost-benefit analysis. Uh, he's in favor of non-intervention, except he, he's now included Canada and Mexico in our defense perimeter. Because after all, if a Russian invade Windsor, Ontario, Detroit can only be next. <laughs> <laughs> and so Mexico is not part of the defense perimeter, except we can't have too many Mexicans in the country. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and then he talks about phasing out NATO. You want to phase it out over a 10-year period. Why not 100? Well, why not 100? Why 10? Right? I mean, finally, I can start you know, it's like they used to say in Vietnam, the pro-Vietnam people at the end were saying, well, we have commitment, we have the soldiers there, we have to, it takes time to get them out. You know, and the, and the anti-Vietnam people would say, okay, in three weeks, you know, you have to use your resources, you get them the hell out, it would take only about three weeks, <laughs> which it did, of course, at the end. So, um, as a matter of fact, I, I, on the Clark White Pair, I saw the first draft of it, and they said, he said 10 years, and when they, like, the uh, director of communications of the Clark campaign said, why not five? Yeah, why not five, eight, twelve? What, you know, what difference does it make? It's all a numbers game. So it's, uh, it's uh, as I say, it's, there's no principle there. There's no, nothing about mass murder. It's all this cost-benefit analysis, and it's all, it's very gradualistic. That's how that's great. <laughs> well, that is, that's by def yeah, by definition. In other words, that's... But this is what opportunism is, is, is diluting your principles in order to make the, 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 the thing appeal to the constituencies you claim as a constituency, like in this case, New York Times liberals. Who are going to vote for Anderson. That's it. See, they might like us, but they love Anderson. <laughs> I, mean, I don't see I don't see why and I mean maybe he'll get their three million votes for Clark. I don't know, but I, I don't see why I don't know, I don't know why anybody would vote for Clark He's not a little parent. I don't see it. I mean he sounds like Anderson, looks like Anderson, talks like Anderson. Why would they vote for Anderson? I just don't understand it. I mean, it's, it's a, to me, it's a sort of a, a peculiar kind of situation. It's truly slightly, uh, this tax cut, okay, this is a sore point with me because on the tax question, uh, I did not sign the white paper, the 48 economists signing the white paper. Uh, it's, a, it's a rotten white paper. It's a white paper. It's true, if Reagan came out with this thing, that we'd all cheer. On the other hand, this is not supposed to be Reagan, it's supposed to be a libertarian candidate, right? So the white paper calls for a 30% revenue cut. Getting, as, as the car people point out very carefully, this is not really threatening anybody, because this is only getting back to the real budget of the 62 Kennedy administration. I mean, we're not cutting the, the, the federal budget more than, than, we're just simply getting back to Kennedy. Who the hell wants to get back to Kennedy? That's not my, that's not my objective in life, to get back to Jack Kennedy. Right? So the idea is that this budget cut will get back to Kennedy because I stuck in my craw to begin with. And second of all, I said, well, the, the, the proponents of this policy said, well, this is only the first year after all. Then the next year we'll do such and such. What do they say about that? They say, we'll do this the first year. Then, this is sort of a neo Lafferite thing, you know, you know about the Laffer curve. Then when we cut this, we cut the 30% revenue cut, there'll be such a tremendous increase in productivity and jobs and everything, then we have, won't have to worry about welfare because nobody will be on welfare because all these jobs will be created. And the people will be so happy about this that they will then clamor for further cuts. And then we will give it to them. How long are they supposed to wait for this clamor to develop? <laughs> it says unspecified clamor. So that means one year of 30%. They're already clamoring. They're already clamoring. Damn, right they're clamoring already. I'm clamoring for it the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a 30%. Um, so Reagan is calling for 30% tax cut over a three year period. Okay? And, and Clark is calling for 30% tax cut over one year period. That's the, that's the big deal. That's what we're going to go to barricades for. It's true that the Reagan cut is phony and all that, but that's not the point. The point is we have, we have not differentiated ourselves on the tax question. We're only slightly better than Reagan on the tax question. So to me, it's not good enough. We're tailing behind the Sixth Liberty Amendment people. Of course, these poor bastards have been calling for the repeal of the Sixteenth Amendment now for 20 years. <laughs> we dismiss that as being radical and irresponsible. How will we, how we, uh, how we support the services of the federal government if we repeal the income tax? Right? So that's, I mean, what we should have done is call for repealing the income tax. And also, the president, this is what Ber Berglund, the uh, senator, called for this, uh, let's say, for the Senate campaign in California. Um, we should call, say, as president, because one of the things that's always asked the presidential candidate is, well, how, what, what would you do, what could you do if president if the Congress is against you? I mean, it's kind of a weird question. Obviously, a part of the really elected president, we have some military kind of congressmen also, <laughs> presumably. At any rate, but even so, even within this peculiar matrix, the president could do something which cannot be challenged by any court 
right? The president has absolute power of pardon. Absolute power of pardon, okay? So the president can announce, or Clark can announce right now, say, when I get elected president, quote, quote, unquote, uh, I, will, I will then immediately pardon all past, present, and future victimless crime people, including tax evasion, okay? This would make income taxes voluntary at least for four years, at least until he's impeached. <laughs> so he doesn't do that. Hasn't got the guts to do that. Hasn't got, got the call from. Huh? He did. He did. He did. Okay. Okay, he didn't, hasn't made that a centerpiece of the well, he doesn't, white paper. Now, now with white paper, he talks about it $200 million. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, see, the, the defense of the Clark people, I, I've had, of course, a lot of discussions with LP members about this. The defense says, no, well, Clark was good in, in Des Moines on July 15th. He came out for immigration, that sort of thing. Well, and my reply to this is, it's a hell of a situation where we have to rely on the inconsistency of our candidate. <laughs> that's, that's really what it is. He's good in some places and bad in others. <laughs> and not only that, one, one thing that has to be mentioned if he's willing to compromise as a candidate when he has no real pressure right. on him, yeah. what's going to happen when HEW starts <laughs> screaming, Don't cut fifty billion dollars from my government budget? What's oh, yeah. going to happen when the CIA yeah. reminds him of the Kennedy oh, yeah. assassination oh, yeah. and the Pinochet? No, that's a good point. I mean, most ideological movements, there's always a problem of selling out an ideological movement. Most ideological movements sell out after they achieve power and they begin slow corruption makes them take place. Or on the edge of achieving power, right? It's just a little bit of a little bit of waffling you can get power. But to sell out, you know, I and mean, if when you have the expectation of maybe getting power in thirty years, that's that's kind of peculiar. That's the earliest sellout in my memory. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. uh, I was a little bit of time right. uh, I'm very good idea. Let's say that given that this was kind of you know, an agreement is reached and there's uh, the satellite is mm. crazy, what is the step to take? If, say, you know, we find that some Central American country has developed the only nuclear weapon in the whole world. But, I mean, that, that, what yeah. happens, you know, we, we can have inspection, but what happens mm. if we get catch someone violating their human rights? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not sure what the what the stuff. I'm not sure, but I'm not sure anybody's got the answer. I mean, libertarian and non-libertarian. Uh, the uh, presumably nobody's going to develop a nuclear weapon if, he, if nobody else has it. Uh, but I, I admit there's a big call. I don't really don't know the techniques of it. I think there are probably certain boycotts that could be done, like boycott the country, boycott the country, the only or something. Yeah, I, that's, uh, I, I, I say, I'm, I'm not sure about the, about the mechanics of this thing. What do you do about inspection and all that? But, uh, I would think that if you had a, uh, I mean, as I say, we have a, we have a problem more and more in the future of all the what's this thing you've got. And, uh, but I think if, if uh, you know if you're not using um, certain materials that are needed for nuclear devices that they're not being used, you know, you can sort of catch it in advance. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what this guy's going to be doing with it, even if he gets it. Uh, how he's going to use it? I, mean, I, I would think something like that. I really don't. That was really a technical question. Mark, yeah. uh, just for the benefit of some non-libertarians, yeah. maybe you can illuminate the libertarian position and the connections between energy and American foreign policy. The idea we're going to go fight for oil. <coughs> I mean, uh, how do we look at that? Well, it's a whole other topic. Though. I mean, it's, 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 uh, I know it's a whole other lecture. Yeah, it's a whole other lecture. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I mean, basically, you don't uh, you don't have to you don't have to grab um, as we know from stream market economy. You don't have to grab resources. You can buy it. That's the uh, basic. You can buy oil, you don't have to, you have to own it yourself. <coughs> so uh, we can buy uh, oil from countries even though we don't, if, we, if we don't like it. I mean, it's the way the market works in general. You, I can buy a sandwich from, from McDonald's, even though I might hate the McDonald's owner for some reason. There's nothing, I don't have to be a friend of McDonald's in order to like their products. It's the same way with buying oil. And uh, so uh, there's a lot of oil, every, there's a lot of energy in oil every place, including the United States, which the which American government is refusing to allow to be publicly to produce. One basis or another. So with with, with all that, I mean, there's no there's no real energy crisis for them. The crisis is probably of a government control. Uh, we managed to design it in such a way we can use mo most of the land in the United States, which is off, taken off the market by the federal government uh, and Alaska. Price controls which prevent domestic oil from being produced. Price controls prevent natural gas from being produced. Uh, all sorts of restrictions prevent prevent coal from being produced. There's a whole bunch of stuff 
basically eliminate the restrictions of being a you know, formal. Um, what specific proposals would you suggest for the military party? Perhaps Clark in the campaign should argue for with regard to the United States government controlled nuclear weapons? The, the nuclear weapons of the United States government at this moment. Well, I don't, well, I don't think, I don't see, well, you know, would argue for a so-called dyad. In other words, he's, he's argued for, we don't need land-based missiles which are, which are uh, superfluous and also vulnerable. We could get much so-called triad. All we need is the submarines and the, and the uh, bombers always in the, in the air. I don't see why we need the bombers. I think submarines are enough, very, very, at very least. Uh, the old style, so called old style submarine, the Poseidon submarine, is plenty. You can kill the Russians 20 times over. Mm-hmm. And it can't be, they can't be discovered at first well, strike. That's just the beginning. What well, I had in mind, actually, was it does seem to me that the turn taking your line yeah. seriously about mass murder, right. which we should, yeah. uh, seems to be very difficult for them actually to come out yeah. with anything other than unilateral disarmament. No. Well, I, I, I would, I mean, since I think we could achieve multilateral disarmament, I don't see the point of unilateral. In other words, I, I, I think the Russians are willing to go along with the multilateral disarmament. If I didn't think they would, I think we should seriously consider unilateral. But since, we, since they are, there's not much point to it. The pacifists, by the way, those uh, in this country, are against the multilateral. They're favored unilateral and against multilateral. Somehow they think it's more moral to have unilateral disarmament. But it seems to me that, yeah, that, that, that you know, if we can get the whole, the whole show, why did why settle for a little bit of it? Yeah. Could you go to a little more depth on why you think the U.S. is black and probably not a lot of well, it's, it's the American Empire at work. I mean, it's, it happens in every empire. You're trying to run the whole show. You're trying to, uh, we want stability for investments, for resources, for all sorts of stuff, for Rockefeller, the world oil investments. Uh, all sorts of reasons, both political and economic. They both, they both mesh in together in the economic sense of uh, propping up investments of all sorts. Uh, so, uh, for example, I mean, just take one one area of the economic political uh, permutation, uh, penetration. Uh, John Foster Dulles, one of the most evil people in American history, <laughs> uh, was Secretary of State during the Eisenhower administration. He had written in 1940 a book called War, Peace, and Change, or 39 and 40, which took a diametrically <coughs> opposite view of foreign affairs than he did 10 years later in 1950. In the 50s, that's he, he say, while well, he's a young man, he might have changed. But he wasn't so young. He was in his 40s or 50s when he wrote War, Peace, and Change. He took a very realistic balance of power outlook toward Europe. He said, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't intervene in Europe. The Germans, many, many of the German demands are correct. We should have adjustments to the Versailles Treaty and so forth and so on. So he took what can be called a non-interventionist uh, position in, in, in Europe in World War II. Then 10 years later, he takes a global crusading position. America is a Christian, Christian morality demands we crush totalitarian communism throughout the world. And uh, he takes, in other words, his whole foreign policy outlook changes drastically. Uh, either it possibly could have had a, you know, could have had an ideological conversion, but somehow I doubt it. Uh, it's also possible his views were influenced by the, the fact that he was a lawyer and also relative of the Rockefeller uh, family and Standard Oil. Knows he's a, his wife was the first cousin of John D. Rockefeller Jr. And uh, he himself was a lawyer for, 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 for Standard Oil and the Rockefeller family. And the fact that Rockefellers were isolationists in Europe in World War II, they had no investments there, they didn't care about Europe. On the other hand, they were interventionists in Asia, they wanted to crush Japan, they wanted to get, uh, they worried about Japanese competition for oil and rubber in Southeast Asia. Uh, on the other hand, of course, the Rockefellers were hip deep in the Cold War with the whole world oil problem. They worried about communists taking, taking over resources. So, that's just one instance of, of economic interest influencing foreign policy. Right, very direct way. Also, by the way, his brother, whole Dulles family, like his brother, Alan Dulles, was head of the CIA and practically was as important as shaping foreign policy as you know, conducting assassinations everywhere and things like that. Uh, and his sister, Eleanor Lansing Dulles, was head of the Berlin desk of the State Department. We have three members of the same family running things. I mean, it's sort of an acme enemy situation. Take one more question. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I would say, I think, uh, since we're relying on mass murder, I don't see any way out. There's no other choice. There's no other no possibility of multi, multi uh, Actually, the, uh, uh, 
uh, American defense uh, and guerrilla warfare will be extremely strong. In other words, uh, we now see that more than ever that the uh, counter guerrilla nation can't really conquer a guerrilla nation. Well, well, Japan surrendered. That's right. That's right. The point is, I guess I had even more powerful weapon, right? And so look the guerrilla warfare in the U.S. I'll just keep right there. In other words, uh, you can defeat guerrilla warfare. No, but the Japan wasn't engaged in guerrilla warfare. They had a... No, they had a right. Because right. they were showing that copy, they knew they better do it. No, I'm sorry. Japan was willing to sue for peace long before Hiroshima and I saw it. Granted, right. almost no nation yeah. would tolerate itself being obliterated right. by something that's a weapon. Right. The one that I'm into is somebody that's willing right. to catch right. it. Right. How it happens. The modern person develops this kind of weapon. I can see why people want to develop this kind of weapon. It's that leverage on getting right. certain kinds of territory, certain kinds of, you know, uh, uh, what territory were they? What territory were they asked for? I don't understand what the what they what were they at? What supposing they say, right, come, were they occupying the United States? Well, they had the ones occupying the Red Dot. Yeah, all right. Yeah, they had the ones occupying the Red Dot. Okay, and he gets some new weapons. Okay, what I'm saying is that certain people might use them. Yeah. So what would you say in the context now? Would you say that under any condition, it's on the ladder, we're minimized, mass murder, which might be a valid point. And I don't think that. Well, I don't think there would be any point right now in occupying the United States. For, uh, as I say, it would be uneconomic and also be. Yeah. Suppose yeah. somebody else did have a point of view. Yeah. Not even Germany. I think that's really Murray. There is a point of view. Right. And I'm going to yeah. make those weapons. Right. Would you still want me to? You do this. Yeah. Yeah, I would. I, I, I would favor multilateral first, if not unilateral. Right. Yeah, but I'm doing multilateral. That's impossible. Okay, well, in case then they have to go for you know, Even though this person owns the That's right. Don't forget, even if we kept uh, five hydrogen bombs, that would inflict unacceptable not, damage. I'm, not, I'm talking about, I'm trying yeah. to get yeah. purely principled, yeah. you know, right. you know, right. you know right. it's a terrible condition, I'm saying right. principled. Right. You have somebody else that has to work. In effect, you're right. saying, well, if he wants it, right. but better, better, uh, right. not red than dead, but better alive than right. new. Right. I'd like to thank Larry Lockhart.